Imagine a situation in which a patient comes to your department with the symptoms of stroke. The initial scan is a CT of the head without contrast. But if there's nothing visible on that scan, what should come next? The answer is CT angiography of the head and neck. Diagnosing the symptoms of stroke is actually the most common reason for performing a CTA of the head and neck. We would perform this examination for stroke, but also for aneurysms, dissections, or other vascular changes that might be affecting the vessels of the head and neck. Remember that the symptoms of stroke can be caused by any interruption in the blood flow to and through the brain. And so stroke can be caused by blood flow changes in the brain itself, or it can be caused by blood flow changes in the vessels that carry blood up to the brain. So those pathologies could include changes to the carotid arteries, the aortic arch, or even the vertebral arteries. We would not scan a CTA of the head and neck for cerebral-only malformations. Here's an example of the different scan parameters between a CTA head and a CTA head and neck. A CT angiography study of the head really does just include the vessels of the brain, and a CT angiography study of the head and neck will include all of the vessels of the brain as well as the vessels that feed blood up into the brain like the internal carotid arteries as well as the vertebral and basilar arteries. Here's an example of the kind of pathologies that we'll be looking for. Both of these images are three-dimensional reconstructions of a CTA head and neck scan. The image to the left is actually a normal CTA scan, and the image to the right is the exact same scan but on a different patient. And in this scenario, the carotid arteries are completely missing from the reconstruction. The carotid arteries are completely occluded, and this patient most definitely is experiencing some of the symptoms of stroke. And this is why, for initial diagnosis of stroke, we would not scan the head only, but we would also scan the vessels of the head and the neck. As with most angiographic imaging, we would scan in the helical mode, which allows for faster scanning. This enables us to quickly follow the bolus of contrast as it moves through the brain, and this also allows for better post-processing. Here are a few examples of the kinds of images that are produced after we acquire the initial volume of data. The image to the left is a coronal MIP image. Exactly what a MIP image is is outside of the context of this lesson, but MIP stands for Maximum Intensity Projection, and the goal of this kind of display is to enhance the vasculature of the head and the neck. It helps to brighten blood vessels and decrease the brightness of surrounding structures. The image in the center is a sagittal reformation also using the Maximum Intensity Projection and the image to the right is a three-dimensional volume rendering of the entire CT angiography head and neck scan. When imaging the vasculature of the head and neck, it is important to use thin slices. We don't need to use slices that are as thin as other studies, but still thin. And so at most institutions, the slice thickness will be around 1.25 millimeters. And of course, this helps to give us higher spatial resolution. With CTA imaging of the head and neck, we are generally not going to tilt the gantry, but we do need to pay special attention to contrast enhancement. As with most angiographic studies, we'll usually use a larger volume of contrast if the patient's renal system can tolerate it. We'll inject a minimum of 100 milliliters, but often as much as 150 milliliters of iodinated contrast. Because we're injecting in the arterial phase and we're especially looking at the blood vessels, it's helpful to inject the contrast at a higher flow rate, so we'd be looking to inject at a rate of 4 or more milliliters per second. Also, remember to scan in the direction of blood flow. The contrast will be flowing from the heart up into the brain, from inferior to superior, and it's very important we remember to scan in the same direction following the contrast bolus from inferior to superior. Most angiographic studies are performed using bolus tracking. The images that you see on the right are an example of the bolus tracking images used during a CTA head and neck scan. The ROI is placed over the ascending aorta or the aortic arch. 
The contrast enhancement of that vessel is monitored until the contrast reaches a specific threshold, at which point the scan would need to be initiated. Since we are looking at blood vessels, the only algorithm that we need to use to reconstruct these images is the standard kernel only. We're really not looking at bones, so there's no need to perform a bone algorithm reconstruction. Just the standard algorithm will do. And of course, if we're reconstructing in the standard algorithm, we'd want to view these images with the traditional standard algorithm window width and window level, which is a 400 window width and a 40 window level. Occasionally with angiographic imaging, physicians will sometimes decrease the window width for increased contrast in the image itself. So don't be surprised if you sometimes see a window width of less than 400. This increases the contrast of the image and really makes those brightly enhanced vessels stand out even more. So that's a review of a traditional protocol for CT angiographic imaging of the head and neck, which is especially for the initial diagnosis of stroke and not for vascular changes that are known to be present only in the head itself.